Moin. Right? <laughs> First of all. OK, thanks for the introduction. Um, there are figures which leave you cold, right? And today, I want to talk about a figure which leaves you dry and eventually hungry. The figure I want to talk about is the figure seven. Because it's all about seven years. Seven years is all that we've got to do what exactly? It's been hinted. But let me tell you what happens in about seven years from now. In seven years from now, water prices will have gone through the roof. As a direct consequence, food prices will have tripled or even quadrupled. And I don't need to spell out the dramatic detail of what happens if food becomes unaffordable for large parts of the population. But I'm not here to spread doom and darkness. I'm here to show you that there is a solution. There's a way out, right? We're actually working on that. And we are working at the moment on one of the largest challenges of this decade, if not this century, which is the water challenge, or to be precise, the fresh water challenge. And I've been focused all my energy over the last years to solve that challenge. Who am I? I'm a nerd, right? <laughs> Well, a physicist, you know the species, right? Super socially active and so on. And nerds love numbers. I do love numbers. And I used to tackle challenges in all kinds of different fields, from material science to optics, molecular dynamics, planetary science, and other things. And I was not entirely happy. Why wasn't I entirely happy? Because I wanted to solve problems which actually benefit society today. So eventually, I kind of got rid of all these other things and focused all my scientific energy on a single question. And that question being, how can we make sure that the freshwater issue will not turn into a freshwater disaster in the next couple of years? But let's take things one step at a time. Right? Because I'm a physicist after all, and we love numbers, or inert, as you like. So two thirds of our planet's surface is covered by water. And I'm sure you know that. Only 2.5% of our planet's water is actually fresh water. That's the water we need to do most of the stuff we use water for. And out of this, 99% is locked either in ice or inside the ground. This means only a tiny, 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 tiny fraction of the water on our planet is actually readily usable for us. Most of these facts are widely known. So let me give you another fact. Let me give you another figure when it gets really interesting. The absolute lion's share of all water is used by agriculture, and that's 70%. This pretty much determines where things grow and how much we can grow. And this dependence becomes even more obvious once we understand that nearly half of the world's food is produced on only 20% of the world's fields, those which are actively irrigated, right? So, Here's the challenge in a nutshell. Our global food system heavily depends upon water. Water is becoming increasingly scarce, and scarcity makes things expensive. And the situation will actually become critical rather soon. We will hit 10 billion people by 2050. This means by 2030, that's seven years from now, hence the number seven, our water demand will increase by 40%, increasing water prices by a factor of six to 12, which in turn increases food prices for basic food stuff by a factor three to four. You think that's scary? Let me tell you that it's getting even more scary. Because an incredible 60% of all the water agriculture is using is wasted due to inefficient practices. Let me translate this into euros. Every year in 2030, water wastage will amount to one to two trillion euros per year globally. A trillion euro, that's a million million euros, a thousand billion euros. A lot of money, in other words, right? Simple language. <laughs> and that's why I'm not exaggerating when I'm telling you that today everybody's talking about CO2, and that's important. We should continue the discussion about CO2. But the fact is that the water issue will kill us long before CO2 ever will. And that's the reason I spend all my energy to solve that problem. So the core question is, why, after 10,000 years of agriculture practice, why are we still wasting so much water? Shouldn't we have nailed that by now, 10,000 years, right? 
Um, so the answer to the question, what we need to do is look at what happens when a plant is actually under stress and dies. So a Gedanken experiment, if you like. Um, let's imagine we have uh, not a little wine, but we have a corn plant in a flower pot. Okay? This is perfectly healthy. Now we assume that we stop watering the plant. What's happening now? Initially, what happens is that, well, the exchange of CO2 and water with the atmosphere is impeded, right? It doesn't happen that much anymore, which means that, well, less transpiration, less loss of water to the atmosphere. Can we see that? No, nope, we can't. Our plant is still looking perfectly healthy. Eventually now, what happens is that the two go pressure, the pressure of water inside the cell walls will go down, the leaves will start to droop, the photosynthetic activity will be reduced, and the plant will wilt. Can we see that? Yes, that's something what we can see. The fact is that only when about 10% of the plants in a field are affected visibly, a farmer realizes that, because obviously a farmer doesn't go into every single plant every single day in every single field, right? They, they simply don't have the time. So what's the problem then? The problem is then, in order to be on the safe side, farmers rather, rather overwater because we can't really quantify it. So they put too much fertilizer and too much um, fungicides and too much pesticides and too much water in the field. And we can't blame them because if they miss the target, if they put too little, then immediately they have less yield and that's their livelihood, right? So the obvious solution is we need to find a system to act before damage occurs, right? To act before there's loss of yield. And that ne means that we need to stop the guesswork. But how do we do this? How can we suddenly start measuring what we can't see? How do we get indications of something which is invisible for us? In order to do that, we need to step out our comfort zone of the visible realm and enter the realm of infrared, to be precise, of thermal infrared. So heat vision. Any of you seen the Predator movies? That's heat vision, right? OK. So, and the reason that this working is quite simple, because in the moment when the exchange of water with the atmosphere is impeded, what happens is transpiration will stop. We have, as animals and humans, transpiration to cool ourselves, same with a plant. So if the cooling system doesn't work, what will happen? The temperature will increase. And that's something which can be picked up by a thermal infrared camera. So rather easy. Wait, there's a catch there. We've got 1.5 billion hectares of agriculture land. We've got another 3 billion hectares of pasture and billions of hectares of forestry. Ooh. This means, back on the envelope cal calculation, a couple of billions of infrared cameras. It doesn't sound too feasible, right? Exactly, that is the problem. It's not feasible. And this is where space is coming in. What we need is thermal cameras in... Oh, excellent. Yeah, this was a bit too late. What we need is thermal cameras in space. If we had thermal cameras in space, they would give us the perfect overview of the states of our crops. With high enough resolution, we can look at every single field, potentially every single day. And the good news is, we don't need billions of cameras on the field, we would only need four cameras in space to look at any field on the globe every single day. Day. And that means these cameras will provide us with the data we need to optimize water usage in every field on the planet. Cool. So that's the theory. Let's look at some of the practical challenges of implementation, because you might well say, well, <laughs> space image, so uh, what do we actually see in a space image? And can this be the basis for successful aquaculture? How do you use that? What does it even look like? Okay. Let's have a look at this image. These are cornfields, not in Freiburg, but in Texas, kind of next door, right? And you see this pivot uh, uh, irrigation systems. Let's look at this picture a little bit closer. We see different shades from, cre from green um, to uh, brownish, I would say, sluggish brown. What is missing is a clear quantification in the image of how the plants are actually doing, because what we're looking is chlorophyll. So if this thing turns brown, it's too late. We, we, we learned that already, right? Fortunately, Infrared technology can help us by providing, by providing, can you maybe go to the next slide? Yeah, you do it? Perfect. By providing, I now do the dance too. Yeah. <laughs> by providing an alternative view. Yes. And the view we're getting is a thermal infrared view. 
because our eyes can't see what is happening. Uh, exactly, that's the one. Our eyes can't see what's happening. We need to translate this into the visual spectrum. So this is a thermal infrared image of this part, and blue images means it's colder, and red images means it's hotter. Okay? And what you can see is the following. First of all, we see interfield variations, but we also get a look at which plants are actually stressed versus which are not stressed, which plants have the fever, which plants are healthy. If we look at the timeline of that, we could actually improve irrigation because we would see the onset of temperature rise, and this is when we need to irrigate. And if it doesn't rise, we don't need to irrigate. This would mean that over-irrigation would be a thing of the past. But I'm sure you've noticed, and I told you earlier, only 20% of the fields on the globe are irrigated. Isn't that, I don't know, wasting a lot of capacity of such a system? Let's do another Gedanken experiment. Let's look at different other use cases. We all know that global irrigation is going to increase dramatically. Right now, in Germany, irrigation doesn't really play a role. Less than 1% of the agriculture area is actively irrigated. In 15 years from now, from now it's 10 to 30%, depending on the estimate. This is the breathtaking slope of climate change as it will, we feel it, in agriculture. But the system provides another benefit, because what we're in fact doing is measuring fever, measuring temperature as a basic health indicator for plants. So we can, for example, use this to time fertilization. And we can do so because fertilizer uptake is best when the plant is not stressed. So by looking at the field, looking at where there's stress and where there's no stress, we can suddenly optimize the timing, meaning reducing the amount of fertilizer. We can see the early onsets of droughts. And even if we can't do anything at all, we could still optimize our planning. Because we would know ahead of time how much food we will have. If we need to resource, if we need to ration food, if we need to get food from other regions of the planet. So it would help us to optimize the logistics. And for all of these use cases, precise and timely information will be the key here. And this system will provide us with exactly that. Now we need a few ones, right? So it will provide us with the basic information on water, on temperature, and on carbon. Because in the end, water determines where we grow things, temperature determines how fast things grow, and carbon is a result as sequestration of carbon in terms of biomass, so sugars, above and below the ground. Let's go crazy, okay? Let's add chemical sensors to the formula. With chemical sensors on top, if we have chemical sensing cameras, we could even add information about roofing material, about the amount of fertilizer in the field. We could quantify the exact amount of water which is in the field. We could look at greenhouse gas emissions, and so on and so forth. This was a subtle hint. Exactly. And all of these things would then allow us to build something which has never been there before. What we would build is a digital twin of our entire planet. So a real-time model that represents the biophysical reality, and it's not just modeled, it is measured, it's the reality that is so vital for us. But before we go on and worship this perfect biophysical atlas, let's get on back on the ground and see what the actual hand-on benefits of such a system would be. Let us assume for a moment that we are a few years into the future. We're a few years in the future, a few of the satellites are already orbiting us and providing respective information. And let's further assume that we use about 15% of their capacity to optimize irrigation. This would allow us to save 60 billion tons of water annually. That's a crazy number. This would allow us to increase global food production by 1% without more resources. 1% doesn't sound too much. That's food for additional 100 million people. That's quite a lot. It would allow us to save tens of tons, megatons, of CO2, simply from reducing energy consumption and soil breathing. And would it finance itself? Yes, because the end user benefit for the farmers would be in the billions too. So, as I said, this is all calculated on the basis that we're only using 15% of the capacity of the system for optimizing smart irrigation. If you look at other use cases, if we use the full capacity of the system, the numbers are just mind-blowing. And what about the cost? Because it's space, right? It's costly. You're right, it is costly. Implementing such a system would cost around 100 million euros. How do I know that? Because we're pretty much midway doing that. 
what has been a dream five years ago is starting to become reality. This is the picture of the International Space Station, and last year we've installed a first prototype on the space station, supported by the European Space Agency and NASA. That was crazy. And it showed that the system is working. We're now running with some of the largest aquaculture uh, um, players in the world, pilots on irrigation, fertilization, seed production optimization, early drought detection, and so on and so forth. Two of the satellites are already in production. The first satellite is going to start next year. This is the first commercial satellite, which will eventually allow us to implement the system. So we are on the right path, and we are well advanced in our journey. Let me sum up what's happened so far. So far, I've established that water is the big challenge of our decade, if not century. And water scarcity will hit us. It will hit us hard. Food production is heavily depending on water, uh, water availability. And water is becoming more and more scarce, and hence more and more expensive. But there's a solution. The solution is to put a single, well, not a single, so to put four satellites into space to look at every single field on the globe. The first satellite will start already next year, and this will allow us to, in time, transition one of the largest global industries. What does it mean for us? First of all, it means in three years from now, rest assured, water will be a bigger issue than carbon is today. Everybody's going to talk about water. Our customers know it, the WWF knows it, we know it too, and I'm sure the media will recognize that soon too. It also means that, well, we shouldn't screw that up, right? We definitely shouldn't mess this one up. Because climate change is water change, and initially it will hit agriculture hardest, and it will hit it fastest in Germany and the rest of the world. So I am asking for your support here. I'm asking for your support to really do what matters. If you're doing something which is not really tackling one of the big problems we have at the moment, I ask you to take the consequence. It feels good to have a purpose and do something which is actually helping our planet. Because I believe that together we can still fix that planet. We can fix it for us, we can fix it for the rest, and we can fix it most importantly, for the generation to come. Thank you.